You're listening to the Ambition Incubator podcast, and I'm your host, Deirdre Morrison. I'll be sharing some bite-sized brain science, thought-provoking questions, and mind-bending ideas about how our brains work, change, learn, and adapt, and how we can use the knowledge emerging from the field of neuroscience to open up new possibilities and make the progress we want in all areas of our lives. Hey there, welcome to this episode. Now, I don't know if you're a coffee drinker, but I am. And I bought a new espresso machine recently, which was kind of a nice thing to do. But I nearly bought the wrong one. And because, as Walt Whitman says, all truths wait in all things, I want to explore what that says about the process of making choices in today's world. Now, for context, this machine is the latest in a long line of coffee machines that go back well over a decade. And this time around, I nearly got sucked into thinking that I needed something that I don't even want. Now, we'll all have faced a situation like this at one point or another. And as I researched the purchase and read the reviews and so on, the whole idea of bean to cup cropped up again and again. And it hadn't really occurred to me before this round of research, but I was curious, so I looked into it. And yes, it sounded great. Even tastier coffee, the aroma of freshly ground wafting at me in the morning. And even my local barista was advocating that I go down the bean to cup route. I was dangerously close to the edge. Credit card in hand, I stopped to think about it for a minute. Yes, I love coffee. Yes, I want it to be an amazing experience. But there were a few things that for some reason were causing me to hesitate. And at this age, I kind of know enough to (laughs) reflect on what that hesitation is and where it's coming from. In this instance, there were a couple of things that came up. Number one. A bean to cup machine is bigger and bulkier. They take up a lot of real estate in a bijou kitchen. Number two, grinding coffee beans is kind of noisy and it's not really a sound I enjoy. And number three, having been through a number of brands of coffee machine over the years, I didn't really want to make a bigger investment in a bean to cup machine with a new brand, only to find that it was as unreliable as the rest. But in this instance, size actually mattered and less was definitely more for me. So I made my choice on the basis of my needs rather than on the need that the market was creating for me. But it would have been so easy to fall for it, so easy to assume that more was more. And this is where I started thinking about how we go about things in our business development. Trying to create a business using online sales and marketing means pushing out content and doing all the things, maybe willingly, maybe reluctantly. It doesn't really matter. But if you're still not anywhere near the big leagues in terms of likes and follows, then perhaps this episode is for you. What I'm going to say might seem a little like we're taking the scenic route, but hang in there because we do have some a la carte food for thought coming up. Maybe it's something that's deeply flawed in me, but there's something about the idea of scaled up personal audiences that troubles me. Actually, there's a few things, but, you know, let's start with Mary Parker Follett and one of her principles. Now, according to Follett, who was an advocate for business and social change back before World War I, there are four potential outcomes from an encounter, and three of them are wrong. The three that are wrong are as follows. Number one, reaching a compromise. Number two, not getting your idea implemented. And number three, interestingly enough, is getting your idea implemented. I'll come to the good outcome in a bit, but let's break those three down a little bit first. Reaching a compromise seems like a strange thing to list as one of the bad outcomes, right? I mean, compromise means agreement, surely. Isn't that what we're striving for? To reach agreement with others? To find ways of working with them? Of course, you've got people like Chris Voss advocating that we should never split the difference. But is that really practical? And is that the kind of people we want to be or the kind of world we want to be in? One with no compromise. Okay, not seeing your idea implemented, that's, that's going to hurt on some level, and it's easy to see why this might be a result to avoid. How's your vision going to get off the ground, and how are you going to prove your value or credibility or worth to those around you if your ideas are getting rejected? But why would seeing your idea getting implemented be a bad thing? That just seems counterintuitive. Now, if you've brought something to the table and it's agreed by all parties, with or without negotiation, then you retain ownership of the solution. But who else is as vested as you are? And this might just be the chink in the armor that we need to test this somewhat strange idea against. Let's go back to compromise for a minute. Now, 
Let's look at it from another point of view to see if we can ascertain why women of such progressive ideas as Mary Parker Follett would have advocated against it. In compromise, everyone has ceded some ground. No one is getting what they really want. And while someone at the table may be feeling lucky to have got at least part of what they want, there's an equal opportunity for someone else to be leaving wondering why they had to give up ground on something that they brought to the table. Whether it was as good, better or worse than the compromise reached is an entirely different matter. What we were arriving at here is buy-in. How do we create buy-in? What are the ingredients of genuine ownership of a decision or course of action by a whole group? And this was her one good outcome, that something new would be created from all the perspectives, experience and ideas around the table. Something that everyone had given birth to. Something that everyone would see as theirs and nourish accordingly. Now, perhaps that's not always a practical approach. After all, too many cooks can spoil the broth. And I've seen firsthand how organisations can drift aimlessly at best and towards disaster at worst because no one was implementing things that had been agreed. I mean, how could we work things out in that fashion and make progress? There's a saying I often heard as a kid, though. The longest road out is the shortest road home. It took me years to work out what it meant. But generally speaking, it means the more preparation you do, the easier things become. And that's not always an easy message to give in these days of being told that you just need this one secret to change your world or this three week program will change everything or, you know, zero to hero overnight. You know, the sort of thing. So when you've got a charismatic driven individual who comes up with a solution and offers to share it, people want to be part of that. They want to have part of it. It's exciting and it's euphoric and it helps us to feel good about belonging to this dynamic group. And the individual's energy and flair and strength make us all believe that we can do it too. And in many instances, that's absolutely right, especially in today's world of skill sharing and online education. They're a perfect demonstration of the Everest principle. They did it and they're showing us how they did it. And that often creates windows in our own thinking that makes it possible for us to also set out in that direction. We're happy to follow that leader, at least for as long as it suits us, or until we get tired or bored or overwhelmed or otherwise disengage. And the longer the daisy chain between the leader and the follower, the weaker the connection is at the end of the day. If one follower in 100,000 is disengaged, then how evident is it really? Which is probably why so few people actually complete the programs and courses they buy. The drop off rates are massive. But interestingly, maybe you've noticed this yourself, it happens a lot less in small, tightly knit groups. And yes, if someone has worked hard to build a following, they're not looking to lose people from it. These business owners are carefully monitoring email open rates, etc., etc., tracking what generates interest, responses and sales. So, yes, I totally get that you can quantify it on some levels. But I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's just me. Um, it still feels like there's something missing in a way. And people with large numbers of followers who are actively providing a service for them, they're definitely listening to the feedback. Otherwise, they're not going to be creating the products that people are lapping up, right? I don't even fully know what I'm trying to put my finger on here. Maybe it's something like the human magic that Hubert Jolie talks about in his book, The Heart of Business. We're in the age of the guru where to be seen is to succeed on many levels. To have people in the tens and hundreds of thousands who actively want to know what you're offering. That's not just an asset, though. That's a big responsibility in a way. Some people thrive on that kind of thing and some don't. And of course, when have people ever stuck to having only one way of doing things? You know, I remember once in primary school, so I was about six or seven years old, I was playing a game during lunch break and I was one of those daydreamy kids. So honestly, I didn't really mind whether I was playing on my own or playing with other kids. On this particular day, I was playing on my own. Now, our play area was on a basketball court and for some unknown reason, we were only allowed to play on one half of it. So the halfway line on the court was a distinct cutoff point. And back in those days crossing the line, literally in this instance, quite often resulted in a slap from a teacher. So I had started this little game for myself um, where I was sitting on my coat in the half of the centre court circle that was on the right side of the line. And I was pretending that I was on a boat and the other half of the court, that was the ocean. Every now and again, another kid would ask me what I was doing. I'd explain and they'd either set their coat down and join me or they'd go back to, to what they were doing. Now, pretty soon the boat was starting to look a bit like a cruise liner and we were singing on the boat and we were watching for sharks and there was a lot going on. 
We were all making it happen, individuals forming a collective. Now, you might ask what that's got to do with, it, with anything and how a six-year-old's playground antics are even relevant. And it's a good question, and maybe it isn't relevant. But in my way of looking at the world, and maybe it is a slightly odd way, I admit, the connections that we form on that one-to-one -one basis tend to go further and create more possibilities. It's a little like the mastermind principle. My idea plus your idea has the distinct possibility of spawning a third idea. It's a sort of polar opposite to the massive scaling, world domination type of approach. It's maybe more like a ripple effect. I suppose the real question that I'm getting to is whether or not we as entrepreneurs have got sucked into the notion of mass visibility as the way to create impact. It's certainly a way, that's for sure. But as I said, never in the history of humanity have we settled for having only one way of doing things. As soon as the second kid joined me on the boat, then it was no longer just my boat. It was our boat. The kid's coat formed part of the structure of the boat, or the fabric of it, if you prefer. You could argue that the boat wasn't exactly going places. It didn't have a plan or a timetable, and this is true. But additionally, it was going exactly where we wanted and needed it to go, on a voyage of imagination that collaboratively got more interesting and more diverse as we connected our ideas and input. A little bit like life itself, wouldn't you say? There's a theory out there that we have a certain number of people that we can really connect meaningfully with, approximately 150 people, according to Robin Dunbar, after whom Dunbar's number is named. Now, this isn't an absolute, that's true. But when we look at the number of people in our personal social networks, for example, they may well run into the hundreds or even thousands. But how many of them do we connect with regularly, say once a month or once a week? I know that I've connected with many, many people over the years. And a lot of those connections are dormant. Others have blossomed and become absolute cornerstones in my personal and professional life. Would I trade those blossomed connections for thousands of followers? How does that saying go? What do we gain if we win the world but lose our souls? Don't get me wrong. Many of the people who thrive and flourish in a large scale domain are amazing. And I've learned so much from them and enjoyed their output. But... Personally, I'm unlikely to ever follow in their footsteps because at the end of the day, I don't like the, the, the distance that would necessarily be between me and the people in a massively scaled circle. My window of people tolerance is not that big. I don't particularly want to be front and center of something, but I want to be part of something that's bigger than me. And there are those who'd argue that those are limiting beliefs and I need to push myself beyond that. But I know that my best work is not in this arena. And that for me to create that and go against my own inner wisdom, well, that'd be just like falling for the bean to cup coffee machine that everyone was telling me I needed, but would have been impractical in my setup. This is probably why one-to-one -one work and small group activities like the TED Foundation Circles program are so central to what I do. It's about co-creation. You can broadcast to thousands, but you can converse with a few. That human magic the elements of serendipity and synchronicity that can only really happen when we connect as individuals. It's horses for courses, right? Looping back a little to the idea that there is never just one way to do something, I'd say that about four in 10 people come to me frustrated with their lack of progress because they're stuck, because they're trying to achieve the wrong thing. They're trying to fit a bean to cup beastie into a space that will only comfortably fit a simpler, neater espresso machine. And how can I tell it's the wrong thing? Well, because of the relief they feel when they let go of it, they look visibly lighter. If you've heard the term body wisdom, you'll know what I mean. Those things that our body knows and expresses seemingly without our conscious knowledge. Let me put it this way. How often do you get caught up with things you think you should do? We live in a world that creates a lot of expectation. You should get a good job or create a good business. You should own a nice house. You should make yourself heard and put yourself out there. You should know your worth and charge accordingly. You should, should, should. What if those shoulds are the problem? I'm not in the business of telling people they should or should not. That's something that each person must decide for themselves. But being caught in that between place that many refer to as a feeling of being stuck, that's something that we can use brain science to shed light on. And often that's all that's needed to free up the decision making process and remove the anxiety, stress and self-blame that go with those stuck feelings. If you've ever been there, you might recognize some of the internal dialogue that's typical of these situations. I should be able to do this. What's wrong with me? Why don't I just work harder to achieve this? Am I lazy? Maybe I don't deserve this. Other people are doing more. Why can't I get this thing done? And we can try to force our way through. 
we should be disciplined. We should be strong. We should set ourselves goals and targets that we can stick to, right? We're adults, for goodness sake. We should be able to just do it. But here's the thing. Have you noticed how many times the word should comes up? If you look in the dictionary, you'll see that should is used to indicate obligation, duty or correctness, typically when criticizing someone's actions. But why is this thing the thing we should do? Why is this the choice we should make? What if we were through the looking glass, if there were no shoulds to worry about? What would we do then? What if there was no criticism and no one in our heads reminding us of what we should do? I'll give you an example. One of my coaching clients wanted some help teasing out the strategy for a new business. As we spoke about his plans, which on paper all looked very plausible, it became apparent that something was not right in this picture. There was hesitation, a lot of hesitation, but the sort that you need to be in the present with someone to see, the sort that's easily overlooked in the co-regulated euphoria of some larger group coaching. You really need to be on as a coach to see this stuff. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a time and a place for group coaching and social learning is an incredibly valuable part of many journeys but sometimes it's a bit like using a sledgehammer to crack an egg. Now, this client wanted to create a new venture, but something was holding him back. All the external pieces were ready to be deployed, but somewhere inside he couldn't move on it. So like a lot of people, he was telling himself he should stop procrastinating and he should just get on with it. And maybe maybe you're expecting me to tell you that we blasted right through his hesitation and dismantled his doubt and off he went and lived happily ever after. Yes, things worked out absolutely wonderfully for him, but. That wasn't because he got pep talks and motivational speeches designed to push him into doing this thing that he thought he should do. Let's step sideways for a second. We accept in the realm of physics that if you have two equal and opposing forces, that is two things pushing against each other with equal strength, they both stop. That's uh, Newton's third law, isn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong. We often forget that this can also happen not just in the external world, but also within us. And this is where we get stuck. We have a set of things that we are conscious of, and more often than not, the thing that we feel we should do but get stuck on is in this category. That thing that we're consciously focused on, that thing we think we should do, it's just the tip of our internal iceberg. Below it is a deep and dense swirl of unconscious thoughts, beliefs, emotions, and habits. Sometimes these are portrayed as things we should, there's that word again, that we should bring under control. And sometimes we can temporarily do that. We can plow our way through for a bit. But more often than not, we end up slipping back, dithering, sitting on the fence or otherwise not getting very far. So what do we do? How do we unstuck ourselves? That's a good question. Here's another good question. Why would your own brain get in the way of helping you to do something that's so clearly what you want to do? This is the ironic bit. Your brain is trying to protect you. This isn't news these days. Your brain has a purpose and that purpose is to keep you safe. That's its primary function. Now, here's the problem with that. Your brain interprets that brief in a fashion that is completely unique to you and devised based on your unique life experience and upbringing. The brain has as many ways of interpreting the brief as there are humans on the planet. And that's what makes this so intriguing. And this is what makes understanding why our brains resist certain things so important. It's not working against us. And the only real solution I found to create lasting ways of avoiding the sensation of stuckness is to start understanding what's going on in there and why. When we start to recognize some of the patterns in how our brain works on a day to day basis, we can start to support it and rewire it. For instance, your brain will try to save you from emotional or physical pain. And it will also try to find ways to conserve energy by doing things that it knows have worked before to keep you safe, to keep you alive. Those ways can include avoiding things which might result in failure and the embarrassment that comes with it, or things that are attached to the relationships in your life. As social animals, we want to know that we're cared for and accepted. With that in mind, you can start to see why we fear embarrassment, ridicule or social exclusion so much. If you're somehow an outcast, then survival becomes a lot more difficult in terms of our longer human history, so we're wired to avoid it. Now, let's go back to my client from earlier. He felt he should start his new business now because he had all the pieces in place and if he left it any longer, he'd be too old. However, as we talked, we also found that he had worries about what would happen if it didn't work out. Would he be a laughingstock? Would he lose the confidence of his existing consulting clients? These aren't things to be dismissed. Other things that came up included the long hours that a business in its infancy would need and how he'd balance that with family life. Again, this is an important thing to consider 
And it's certainly not something that his brain was just throwing in as a deliberate spanner in the works. What I'm saying is that if you're feeling stuck, there's probably a reason for it. And understanding how your brain works can help. Tapping into the strengths of your left and right hemispheres, for instance, can open up ways to think creatively about the options you have. And the trick is to tap into the strengths of both sides because they see the world very differently. When I'm thinking about this stuff, I'm often reminded of Mrs. Green, my class teacher when I was 11. I remember her telling us that when she was a girl, they got a vacuum cleaner. And considering how long ago that was, it must have been the first one ever made. But she was often scolded for not storing the cable the right way until someone explained to her that the cables would break inside their casing unless they were neatly put away. Then it made sense to her and she remembered to do it properly. And learning a bit about how our brains work is kind of like that. We don't know what we don't know. And when we start to understand what's going on, then we can make the changes we need to prevent the unhelpful outcomes that we'd otherwise experience. It's easy to get stuck in thinking about things from a single perspective, the thing we should think, the thing that complies with expectations. Knowing how to move ourselves out of that stuck frame of mind when we need to is a skill that we can use in all aspects of our lives. And the way to know how to do that is to understand how and why our brain does the things it does. I call it advanced driving skills for your brain. Anyone can drive in a straight line, right? But it takes more skillful handling to get the best out of your car. Learning when to push through our personal comfort zone and learning when to listen to what we know to be our personal truth is a very fine line. And it's one that we often need help disentangling. My truth here is that I love making meaningful connections with far ranging impacts on a scale that I choose with my one to one clients and in small groups. But here are some questions for you if you feel stuck in developing your business, whether it's to do with audiences or teams or products. Take your time with these questions, by the way. What do you aspire to create with your business? Why is it important to do that? What have you tried to do to bring this about so far? What got in the way? What are other ways that you might do it? And if there was just one thing that your entire life's work could change, what would that be? Is that thing worth shaping your life to achieve? Now, if the answer isn't a resounding yes, then I think we're actually getting somewhere. Now there's somewhere to start working out what that resistance really means. If you want to explore some more and maybe learn some of those advanced driving skills for your brain, then I invite you to go on over to ambitionincubator.com and check out some of the things that I do with my clients. Maybe you'll find that one of them is a good fit for you. And with all that said, I suppose there's really only one thing to do, and that is to tell you that I ended up buying a Breville mini barista (laughs) which makes a damn fine cup of coffee. So thank you so much for listening. And we are coming to the end of the year again. So I guess it is a good time to reflect on a lot of things. And I've enjoyed reflecting on this today. So thank you for listening. Bye. Hey, before you go, I want to take a moment to say thanks for tuning into this episode of the Ambition Incubator podcast. And just check to make sure you know that you can join me each week for a deep dive, dynamic, collaborative reading of some business classics. You'll find all the information you need when you register for free at ambitionincubator.com forward slash BBC. I'll see you there.